Hi everyone, welcome to another video. Um, today we're going to have a look at Autodesk Revit. We're going to strip it right back into a Revit architecture demonstration. Um, and hopefully this is going to be really useful to anyone that's new to Revit, anyone that's maybe looking at subscribing to Revit, moving from AutoCAD or transitioning from another 2D application or indeed another 3D application. Um, so we're literally going to start from scratch and start a new file in Revit. When you start a new file in Revit, it pulls from a template known as an RTE um, and based on that template, much like in AutoCAD or any other system, if I'm honest, um, you have a load of settings and standards that are set by default. Line styles, line weights, families, so on and so forth. Um, and once we start that template, we get placed into a default view. So here we can see we have a floor plan with four elevation markers, top, bottom, left and right, representing north, south, east and west. Interface, very easy to understand. We have a ribbon bar at the top split into several different tabs. Each tab is split into a number of panels relating to the specific tool set that you're looking at. For example, if you wanted to draw an architectural wall, you'd go to the architectural tab, look at the build panel and select wall. Likewise, if you wanted to draw a structural wall, you'd go to the structural tab, look at the structure panel and draw a structural wall. All the commands have tooltips, as you would expect, and each of those commands also has a keyboard shortcut shown here on the screen in brackets. For example, the keyboard shortcut for a wall is WA. You don't have a command line, so AutoCAD users out there don't need to press return. You literally press WA and it will start your wall tool. So um, very intuitive, very easy to work. We have a graphics window in the middle, and then we have two panels on the left, namely our properties bar and our project browser. They can be moved around the screen using standard um, Windows docking methods, um, but I like to leave them on the uh, bottom left hand side there. Um, so really easy to work with Revit and actually although we are 3D modeling, we're doing all of our drawing um, and all of our work predominantly in 2D. So we've got a simple floor plan here and all I'm going to do to begin with is change using my project browser into a different view. In Revit we have a 3D model um, so rather than let's take AutoCAD as an example where you have um, paper space and model space we have something similar in Revit where we have project views and sheets but we have a 3D model so to draw that accurately we need to be able to look at that model in different ways from different levels. For instance I can go down to my elevations here and open up an east elevation. We can see that I have two datum elements on my screen. These are known as grids, um, not, not grids, sorry, levels. And these levels are basically giving me an area of which I can draw. So I have level zero, I have level one. I'm going to go ahead and go to architecture, datum panel, and draw another level in there. I want a simple two-story building. So I'm going to draw another level. You'll notice when I'm drawing that I get the, um, the intuitive snapping and object tracking, much like you do in AutoCAD and any other system out there. So it's very easy to start drawing. If you keep your eye on the project browser on the left, you'll note I've got levels 0, 1 and site. If I finish with my second click to add level 2, you'll notice that I now get levels 0, 1 and 2 in my floor plans. So really intuitively, it's automatically creating me a level to look at when I create my level. Once I've got that level created, I can control its height, so I can change it from 8 meters from the floor um, to a different measurement if I should want to, just by coming in and selecting that 8 meter measurement and changing it to maybe 7.5 meters. Or I can change this dimension from level 1 and say that it's 4 meters above level 1. So again, very intuitive and very easy to work with. These are basically going to end up being constraints. So Revit is fully parametric. So I can control what levels are going to exist in my building. And from those levels, I can start creating parametrics whereby a wall might run from level 0 all the way up to level 2. Or a component might sit on level 1. That means that you then have intelligence between the components and the levels so that if one moves, the other moves. For instance, we're going to head straight over into my level 0 floor plan. So I'm looking at my floor plan at level 0. And I'm going to start my wall creation. Now, those 2D users amongst us are very used to drawing lines, polylines, arcs, circles, rectangles inside of your CAD application of choice. 
And what I'm here to tell you is Revit is no different. We're looking at a top-down 2D view floor plan and we're drawing with lines, arcs, circles, squares and polygons. What's different is the way that Revit takes that line and does something with it. So in AutoCAD, you may be using an intelligent dynamic block or, or simply drawing a line and offsetting it and drawing another line and offsetting it and adding some hatches. In Revit, we have what we call families. We have lots of different families of all different size and shapes. But basically, we have a family whereby we've got a configuration of wall, which has a number of layers. This specific wall has brick, cavity, block and plasterboard. That wall can be completely controlled and defined using an editing tool set where we can come in and say, OK, well, I, yes, I want brick. Yes, I want fiberglass, so on and so forth. But actually, I want a thicker layer of plaster or a thicker plasterboard or two level, layers of plasterboard, whatever it might be. And we can come in here and make changes to the plan of that particular wall or to the section of that particular wall to change um, any element of the build-up of that wall, whether it's adding a coping stone to the top of the wall, adding some detail to the base, cutting into the wall, adding swept detail around the wall. So we have a lot of flexibility. All I'm going to do for this example today is choose a standard brick wall, and then I'm going to look at my options bar just underneath my ribbon. I'm going to draw my wall unconnected at 8 metres. I'm actually going to change that and say I want to draw specifically to level 2. I'm drawing using the center line of the wall and I want to chain. I'm not drawing with an offset. I don't want to add a radius to the corners. I then simply start drawing left to right, just like you would inside of AutoCAD or similar. I'm going to draw from here across. I'm not being overly accurate for the purpose of today. I'm going to draw something that looks a little bit like a, a H shape for this, uh, this modern house that I'm going to be drawing in this example. Um, we'll come back and add some dimensions shortly, but I'm not overly fussed about the size or shape for the purpose of what we're doing today. But what you will notice is when I'm drawing, Revit is instantly giving me feedback. It's giving me intuitive dimensions, which I can chop and change in the exact same way that you would inside of AutoCAD. So once I've got these walls, let's just center them up a little bit inside my elevations. Once I've got these walls, I can see that although I've basically been drawing lines, Revit has come along and it's added all of this detail and all of these intelligent joins to make me, for all intents and purposes, a wall rather than a line. If I go ahead and look at my elevation that I had open a second ago by using these tabs on the top, it keeps all of your recently opened windows open. I can see that I have this wall. Let's change this to shaded and fine. And I can see that this wall is spanning from level zero, where I was drawing it, up to level two, which is where I added the constraint. If level 2 moves, as you would expect, the walls move with the level. So it's very easy to come in and start configuring your walls and your components to sit where you want them to sit and work the way that you want them to work. If you didn't want them to sit on that specific level, you could change them to be unconnected and give them an unconnected height of whatever it is that you want to give them. Okay, It really doesn't matter, it's very flexible. And absolutely in the background, although we are working in 2D and we're doing all of our drawing in 2D, Revit is going ahead and it's drawing these 3D walls and these 3D elements for us in the background. So we're not actually drawing actively in 3D. We're drawing in 2D and Revit's doing the 3D for us. Let's head back to the floor plan. And with that floor plan now, we're going to say that we want to draw a floor. So we want to add a slab to the ground floor. So I select my floor tool, and just like with my wall, I have a type selector where I can come in and choose a different type of floor. Much like with the walls, we could come in and edit that buildup if we want to. So we can change the sectional buildup of that floor if we need to. Again, I'm not going to for the purpose of today. We don't need to. So all I'm going to do is say, actually, this time, I don't want to draw lines, arcs, and circles. I want to reference geometry that already exists. Now this is interesting because I could, can either reference existing walls, which is what we're going to do in this example, or I can choose to pick lines that exist in the drawing. Guess what? That means that we can import or more reference and link an AutoCAD DWG or another 2D uh, CAD format into Revit, pick the 2D lines from AutoCAD and get them to be turned into intelligent parametric 
Revit walls, which is really, really beneficial. In this instance, we're going to choose Pick Walls. And I'm going to go around and pick all of the external walls making up the ground floor. You'll notice that Revit is automatically extending my floor, the pink line, the boundary of the floor, which is being represented by that pink line, to the core of my wall. I could flip that using these arrows if I wanted to, to put it under the plasterboard or under the finish face. But in this particular instance, yes, I want that to be within that ground floor or within that wall, sorry. If I go ahead and press the tick, Revit has a level of intelligence. It comes in and it puts that information on there and it builds that wall, uh, that floor. If I go and have a look in my 3D view, we can see that alongside my walls, I now have a floor, which looks like this. Let's go back to our floor plan and let's go ahead and add a ceiling. I'm not too fussed about the internal partitions yet. So let's come down to my projected ceiling plans or reflected ceiling plans for level zero. And I want one continuous big open plan space here. Would typically need lots of structure and some steel in there. I'm not worried about that today. I'm just looking at the architectural design. So let's go ahead and add a ceiling. I want a plain plaster ceiling. And I want that to be maybe just over three meters off the floor. And then I'm going to go ahead and click inside this big open space. Revit will go in and it'll automatically add a ceiling, which again, we can confirm if we go and look in 3D. We now have a floor, a wall, and a ceiling. If we go back to our ground floor once more, we're now going to add some detail. So I want a couple of interior rooms. And I want some detail to the front of this, some windows, some doors, so on and so forth. So let's go back to our wall tool. Let's go ahead and pick up our um, one of our default families for a 75 stud partition wall. And in here, again, I'm just going to draw lines, arcs and circles. The exact same process as you would do inside of the likes of AutoCAD or Bentley or whatever it else it might do. But you guessed it, rather than drawing a line, an arc or a circle, Revit is going ahead and it's actively adding in partition walls for me. If I go ahead and change my view to a fine level of detail down the bottom, Revit will go in and it'll actually show me the individual layers and levels of the wall. So again, it's very intuitive and it's doing what we would expect it to be able to do. So we have those internal walls based here. Let's go and place some components. I don't actually want to add any windows in here. I want to use um, curtain walling so I have some big um, nice full length windows, but I do want to add some doors. So I'm going to go to my door tool and rather than using some of the out of the box families that are loaded in this template by default, I'm going to come up here and say that I want to load a family from my default library. Revit comes with a, a fairly extensive library. It's not exhaustive, but it comes with a fairly extensive library of components, doors, windows, plumbing fixtures and fittings, so on and so forth. But I'm just going to come in here and say that I want to have an internal single door and just pick one from this list that I like the look of. I'm going to go with doors int single six and open that up. Now that family has three different types, 810 width, 910 width and 1010 width. I'm going to place some of each. You'll see why later, but I'm going to go with an 810 width and place it in the center of this wall. You'll notice that Revit's been very intuitive for me. It's actually given me really nice snap points. The closer you zoom in, those snap points get smaller and smaller. The further away you zoom out, those snap points get bigger and bigger. It makes it very easy to get things like the center of a wall or the center of a component, whatever it might be. So I'm going to place this door here, and then I've got to go ahead and make a slightly bigger door, the 1010, and I'm going to place it just here. I'm going to cancel out of there a couple of times and choose to add a new door, loading in a family, but this time I'm going to go to my external doors, and go ahead and choose one of the external doors inside of Revit's default families. This one will do for this example. Let's open it up and let's choose to place him on this wall here. Again, we're going to try and eyeball it roughly in the center, which is very easy to do with Revit's functionality. So I've got some doors on there. That's all I want at the moment on the ground floor, but I do want some detail on here and on here. Now Revit is very sensible and quite intelligent with the way that it works. So I want to draw a curtain wall along here within the brickwork and along here. 
If I accidentally make a mistake like drawing a wall, choosing my empty curtain wall and just going ahead and drawing roughly, just eyeballing it again for the purse of today in there, Revit will give me a prompt. Revit will come up and say, oh, hang on, you've done something which I don't think is correct. It's highlighting the problem in orange on the screen and it's giving me a warning on the bottom right hand side corner. In this instance, it's telling me that I've drawn two walls over the top of each other. So I have a bad design, an invalid design. It's really useful to have that in the background because Revit's constantly almost checking up with what you're doing in certain instances. So what I should be doing is saying, go to my wall, choose my curtain wall, but choose that this family should be automatically embedded into any existing wall geometry that it comes across. If I now do the same thing again, Revit will intuitively merge those two walls together. So I'm going to have a curtain on the left and on the right hand side of this building. I'm going to go and have a look at my south elevation. And with that south elevation, I'm just going to select this wall. And I'm going to say that I actually want this to be unconnected at a height of three meters. And I want the base offset off the bottom to be roughly 150. So I'm setting it just off the bottom there and it's three meters in height. I can do the same thing with this one or I can use AutoCAD functionality essentially and say that I want to modify, match type, select my source and select what I want to match. Instinctively I could have also select both at the same time and made the property changes on the left. Alongside that I'm just going to say that I want to add in some grid lines in there. So let's get an idea of what this is going to look like. Let's go to architecture. Let's go to curtain grid. And I want to split these curtains up into four panels on each. I want those panels to be equal size. So I'm going to come in and say add a dimension. We typically always use a lined dimension unless otherwise specified inside of Revit. Obviously, we can't use an aligned dimension for a diameter or an angle. So we use aligned, and I'm going to do a running left to right dimension of this curtain wall. And place that down at the bottom. Revit has parametrics, and it's intelligent enough to say, do you know what? Make all of those dimensions equal. Revit will go ahead and make all of those dimensions equal on the left hand side. I'm going to go and do the same thing on the right hand side now and make all of those panels equal in size. I'm just going to cancel out of that and then go back into my level zero floor plan. Let's move up to the first floor and the way I want this building to work is actually having um, not quite full height on the left just up to the first floor in the middle and then a full height elevation on the right hand side. So I want some quite uh, some nice aesthetics to the outside of the building. So I kind of need to think about this when I go up to the first floor and start modeling because I'll need a separate slab here and a separate slab here, no slab in the middle and a roof, so on and so forth. So I just need to think a little bit about how I'm going to set out the building as I'm going through um, and modeling it in such a way that it makes my life easier moving forward. So the first thing I'm going to do is go up to my first floor. And I'm going to put on two slabs. You'll notice that when I go to my first floor, let's just close my hidden windows just to close some of these that I'm not using at the moment to keep Revit running nice and quickly. I can see that, yes, I see my external walls, but I can see a kind of grey scale or grey style um, version of certain elements on the floor. The way that Revit looks at its views is it has what we call a view range, and it also has an underlay. The view range controls where's the top of the level and where's the cut plane for example am i going to look at something in a section or am i going to look at something as if i'm looking at it from the top down that's what affects the top and the cut plane i can then have a depth of level as well um, as an underlay to control whether or not i want to see geometry either above or below the current level i don't want it in this particular example so i'm going to turn off my underlay range and say that i have no base level just to see this particular geometry in the model. Let's go ahead and add a floor. Let's choose rather than a ground floor, let's go for a timber floor on the first floor. And I'm going to select 
these walls. I only want this side. So the first thing I'm going to do is make sure I use trim and extend to extend these two lines to make a corner. The next thing I'm going to do is make sure that this is going to underneath of my plasterboard because that's how this particular wall would work. I'm confirming that I'm on level one. I'm confirming that my geometry that I've drawn is what I'm after and I press the tick. Revit now gives me some input because it has intelligence. It's saying, OK, well, hang on. You've got a floor that's basically going into or for more of a better word, clashing with the plasterboard layer on the wall. Would you like to cut the wall with the floor? Well, yes, I would, because I want to make sure that any material information I've got in here or any quantity information that I might get out of here later comes through correctly. So if I just strike a quick section up here and have a look at that section for you, you'll notice that we now have a wall which has had its, um, its shape or its profile modified by the floor. OK. So Rev is doing all of that for you automatically so long as you accept um, the relevant prompts that come up. Let's do the same thing on the left hand side. Let's add a first floor, no offset, using timber and we're going to go around selecting the outside walls and then choosing to create an enclosed shape. Once you've got the shape that you're happy with, we confirm that everything is as it should be and we press the tick. I now have floors on the left and right of the model and nothing in the middle. Let's go and have a little look in 3D and we can see that this model is coming along. I'm going to select these two central walls. They're only ever going to go up to sort of level one. So I'm going to drop them down to level one to get an idea of what that's going to look like. I'm going to add in that roof. So let's go across to level one floor plan. We can't see those walls at the moment because they're cut off at level one, remember, so they're underneath where I'm currently looking. That's not a problem because I can start tiling windows and saying, OK, well, to make my life easier, let's just select those. And whilst they're going up to level one, we could just give them a bit of an offset, maybe 1500 meters, uh, millimeters or so, just to be able to see them in this view so that I can reference them and use them. Let's close down that 3D view. And then just make sure that these walls are cut in the relevant way. So um, this wall needs to finish at this point, basically, rather than going into here. So I'm just going to pull this wall away. I'm going to make sure I use uh, Trim and Extend just to get these walls to the correct place. Like so. Let's go ahead and add an architectural roof using a footprint. I want an overhang of about 150 millimeters and I'm going to have a slope on this side and this side of the roof. I'm now going to turn off slopes and I'm going to choose to either pick an existing line or draw a line. Let's choose pick line and pick the finish face of this wall. And also the finish face of this wall. I can then use trim and extend to corner to tidy up this corner this corner and these corners here. Now because I've defined a slope here and here, I'm going to have two gable ends either side that are going to be flush with these walls and these walls. Let's go ahead and press the tick. Let's go and have a look in our default 3D view and see how Revit has created those components. The roof's gone in there. It's not cut the uh, the walls with the roof, so I can select these two walls individually and say attach the top to the roof. Those walls will then be cut down to size so that they are being cut by that roof. Let's just go across back into level one floor plan. Let's go and grab this wall and say right click create similar going from here to here and the same over here. Select this wall, right click, create similar, going from here to here. I need to make sure these walls are connected in the right way. So let's just make sure that they are being connected. So let's go to our modify tool and grab and extend. That's what 
problem is. Two seconds. Let's just pull this one back. Picking just that point there. And then let's drag these walls together. Like so. Okay, I can see the problem. This one's the wrong way around. There we go. They should be able to be dragged together nicely now. That's my, estate, my mistake. My apologies. So let's come in there and make sure that this is butt up to that edge as well. Perfect. So let's go and have a little look at our 3D view. Yep, good. We've now got our additional walls that we need to, to fill up that gap there. And I'm going to select those and make sure that their properties match this one. So we're going to go for an unconnected height. We can drop that down so that it matches the others. Let's go all the way up to our roof level now. As we've drawn this roof, let's add these additional roofs on. So let's go up to level two floor plan. On level two floor plan, I'm going to add a roof on the right hand side. Same thing as before, but I want the gables at a different end. So 150, defined slope here and here, undefined slope here and here. Trim and extend corner. This time I'm going to use keyboard shortcut TR to make that profile. I'm going to accept that and say yes, I would like to automatically cut the walls with the roof. Do the same thing on the other side. Roof, define slope with a 150 overhang here and here. Do not define slope here and here. Use trim to corner to extend and create a closed loop. This one on the left I want slightly lower than the right. So I'm going to use a base offset here of maybe minus 1500. Press apply. Press the tick. Say yes, I would like to attach the walls and go and have a look at my 3D view. I now have something that looks like this. So let's add some more information to the first floor now. Let's go into my first floor layout on my floor plans. Let's go ahead and choose my wall and pick up my internal partition, my 75 mil stud that I was using earlier. And on that first floor, I'm going to say that I want the following configuration of rooms. Maybe I want to have a room here and here. And then maybe I want to have another room here and here. Let's go ahead and pick my door, grab my internal door and choose to place some doors inside the model. Again, I'm purposely using some different sizes um, because I want to use a door schedule to show you guys that later on. So I'm purposely going in and using some different sizes of doors to have some different results. Um, I'm also going to use some different types of doors to again give some, um, some slightly different results. So let's just load another internal door in here and just choose one that I've not chosen yet that looks a little bit nicer than those. That one will do. And I can add that in just here. Again, I'm not too fussed showing dimensions or anything like that for the purpose of this demonstration. We, we can see very quickly how we can build up this particular model. On the right hand side, I'm going to do the same thing. So let's go and grab a create similar on my wall. I'm going to draw a configuration of rooms there and there, making sure that I don't uh, draw two walls in the same place. And then leave the rest of this room open plan. Again, I'm going to use a couple of different configurations of doors. Let's use that one just here. And let's use that one just here. I'm just going to tweak this wall out to the right a little bit and then reposition this one so it's a little bit uh, more spacious. Okay, quite happy with that. I'm going to go to my wall tool, go ahead and grab my empty curtain wall once again and draw a curtain wall on the first floor. I'm going to go and take a look at my south elevation. Grab this curtain wall and this time grip edit it to come down a little bit. I'm going to use my align tool, which is either modify and align or AL on the keyboard to align the curtain top and bottom. And I'm also going to say that I want to draw in 
a new curtain grid here, here and here and I want to align that curtain grid with the one at the bottom and lock it into position. By pressing the padlock this creates a parametric constraint to make sure that if this curtain grid moves the other curtain grid moves with it. Just cancel that back. On top of that, maybe I also want to change the profile of the top one. I want it to match the curvature of this uh, this roof here. So I'm going to grab this particular curtain wall, edit its profile. I'm going to grab an offset tool, choose to offset by about a meter, and then say pick existing lines and pick the roof. Make sure my offset was actually turned on when I pick the roof always helps. So offset by about a meter, pick the roof and offset inwards there and there. I'm then going to use my good old trim or extend to corner to trim the relevant lines on the sides. Delete the top one to create this closed loop. I'm going to accept that. Revit will automatically extend these profiles for me. I then want a horizontal grid there. So curtain grid and then I can come in and add a horizontal one wherever I want one. Let's say about there, and then maybe we'll just move that up and eyeball it for the purposes of this. It doesn't really matter. We can have the ability to do whatever it is that we want to do. Maybe we'll add a dimension and control that that top beam there is at three meters to match the panel size at the bottom. Let's go back to our 3D view. Starting to take shape now. We've got a few instances where our walls haven't been uh, cut correctly. I didn't put a ceiling on in this um, uh, this upper level, so I'm not too fussed about this for the purpose of today. I'll just use the uh, the underside of the roof there. So I'm going to come in and select these walls. You notice I can select through the glass, no problems at all. And I'm going to attach those walls to the underside of the roof. And I'm going to do the same thing on this side. To make my life a little bit easier, maybe I'll put on a 3D section box by selecting the view properties, turning on a section box, selecting that section box and bringing it backwards so that I can see in and bringing it in from the side. I'm now going to go ahead and select the relevant walls in the build up that we've done previously. Holding down control to multi select. Once we've got all of them, attach them to the roof. Turn off the section box by selecting nothing and unticking section box. Let's go back to the level zero floor plan, make a couple of additional changes here. We're just going to add one more curtain wall. So select this one, right click, create similar, and we'll do one more just here. Once again, we'll use our south elevation and just eyeball in a couple of grids. And make sure that they are positioned equally. Let's just tidy this up a little bit, grab my level markers in this particular elevation and move them out to the right and left. And we have something that is starting to look quite nice. I want to add a balcony to the first floor, so let's go up to level zero. Um, we want to add a balcony, but as part of that, maybe I want some windbreak um, and also a bit of a design feature. So I'm going to grab these walls in turn and just pull them out a little bit just to extend them. I could come in and add a dimension to say that I specifically want that to be two meters. So let's measure from there to there and let's pull this wall out two meters. Maybe that's a little bit too much. Maybe we'll go 1500 and then do the same thing for the other walls as well. Just snapping and tracking them into place, just like you would if this was AutoCAD or any other 2D system. Once I've done that, I expect that my roof needs to be tweaked. So let's go into my 3D view and show you that as well as working in 2D, we can also choose to select components and edit them in 3D, meaning that I can pick up this edge and align it to the front of what I've just created before saying finish. And we'll do the same thing on the right hand side and align using the front face here to that line. Let's go back to our level one floor plan. Let's go and pick up our floor tool. Let's say that we want to have this upper floor and I'm going to say pick wall here and here. I'm then going to say pick lines here, here, here 
and here. Trim all of these together to create a single profile. Need to make sure you have one closed loop, not two. If you've got two, they need to be within each other so they create a single element. Join them up at the front. Maybe just make sure that they are aligned to wherever it is that you want them on the geometry, so on and so forth. Once we've got that, we can press the tick to create ourself a balcony. And once we have that balcony, perhaps we'll just very quickly say, add a railing. I want a nice glass panel railing and I want to pick this wall, or this slab, sorry, and have that railing hosted on level one. There we go. So it's very quick to start getting results inside of Revit. We can really quickly start putting geometry together um, and really intelligently building a model up. It's fast. It doesn't matter whether you're working in 3D. It doesn't matter whether you're working in 2D. But typically speaking, as you've seen, we do a lot of our drawing in 2D. Um, we're drawing in, in plan views. We're drawing in sections, so on and so forth. So it's, uh, it becomes very natural to work in and very easy to work with. Little things that just compared to CAD are so ridiculously quick, like when we added these doors, it's automatically trimming, extending, filling, changing hatches, um, cutting holes in objects, cutting openings. It's doing what we would expect it to do extremely quickly. Obviously, I'm not going to that much of a level of detail at the moment in this particular model, but you can see how fast it is to model, to add dimensions, to change dimensions. doesn't matter if you're doing something quickly and conceptual like we are here, or if we're doing something a little bit more accurate with a lot of dimensions, as you guys would typically be doing in anger. Very quick to use, very easy to use, and actually good fun as well at the same time. So once we've got this, I'm just going to save this for a second, just on my desktop. I'm just going to call it uh, Project 1 for the purpose of this at the moment and save that down. So we've got this design. Um, maybe we'll just add a staircase in and, uh, and show you how easy it is to cut an opening. So let's go down to level zero. I'm not worried about a staircase up this end. Eventually, we'll have separate stairs on this side and this side. Um, maybe this is going to be a holiday house or a nice modern house and we've got uh, a separate wing. So all we're going to do is say, um, do you know what, add a staircase. I'm just going to say choose a standard private stair, edit that staircase so that I can have a slightly um, bigger riser height because that one is a little bit low by default. And then based on that um, set of properties, you basically have stair calculations. So it will take your maximum riser height, your tread depth and any calculation rules that you've defined. And it'll allow you to build a staircase based on those. So I'm going from level zero to level one. And it's saying based on 16 risers, it's going to use a riser height of 250. I could change this to get, calculate the riser height, um, so on and so forth. If I go over something that it doesn't like, it will give me a warning and say you're now not working to the parameters that you've defined on your staircase. I want a meter width. And I want to be drawing the exterior support left, so the far left hand side of the staircase. I'm going to draw along this wall, have a little landing halfway, and then go along this wall. When I start drawing my stairs, Revit will instantly give me a preview, with a little bit of text to show me how many risers I've created and how many are remaining. So I'm going to go up maybe 10 stairs or so, click my mouse, then I'm going to leave a gap. I'm going to use tracking to pick this edge on this wall and start drawing the rest. Meaning I'm going to go up 10 steps, have a little landing here and then go up a further 10 steps. I'm just going to put a selection box around there, choose to section that selection box before I press the tick to finish my staircase. I can select that section box and make it a little bit bigger like so, to see exactly what's going on. And actually, this isn't looking too bad. I don't want the railing that's um, next to the wall. I only want this one here, so I'm going to take the one out that's next to the wall. It's not necessary. 
and then I can come in and start cutting the ceiling and cutting the floor so that it matches this staircase. So let's grab the floor first of all, edit its boundary, choose existing lines, maybe I'll pick up this part of the staircase and this part of the staircase. Come pick up the very bottom just here and by using those lines I can ensure that I have an opening in the exact positions that I need around the staircase. I then just use trim and extend corner to make sure that I only have one continuous fully closed loop. If you didn't, Revit would incidentally give you a warning. Once I've done that with my floor, I'm going to grab the ceiling and do the same thing. Edit the boundary, picking this time the lines that we've already created on the floor. Before grabbing trim and extend to corner. And making sure that I have one closed continuous loop before creating that opening. Those openings don't have to be square, by the way. We can use uh, curves if we want to. Just by selecting editing boundary and rather than drawing the lines, we could quite easily add in an arc. Selecting there to there and adding in some curvature. It's not a problem. It works pretty much however you want it to work at the end of the day. Um, it's very flexible. It does exactly what you would expect it to do. And it works extremely well. We could then take this railing and extend it around there should we want to. I'm not going to bother for the purposes of this. It's absolutely fine for what we have today. So let's save the model. Now, once I've got a model, I want to start pulling information from here. So the first thing I want to do is get an idea of what doors I've got in the model and maybe what they look like. So I'm starting to think about what I might have on paper. This is very easy to do inside of Revit to start detailing. One of the arguments that we get an awful lot with not just Revit but other 3D applications is I don't get the detail that I require. I need to use AutoCAD still to make sure that I have the right sectional or constructional information in the model. And this just isn't true. Revit is extremely good at adding detail and it actually does it very, very quickly with a set of intelligent families. Firstly, I want to add a door schedule and a door legend to match that schedule. The key here is, as you've seen, everything that we add in the model has properties. It has instance parameters and it has type parameters. All of that can be pulled at the press of a button. So I could say view, schedules, schedule slash quantity, and say that I want to pull off a door schedule. You will notice all of the other categories that we have but not just for architecture, for structure, mechanical, electrical and piping as well, should you have full Revit. We want to just have our architectural schedules for this example today, and we want a door schedule. We can give it a name. And then once we're in that schedule, we essentially find properties that we want to use and then add them to the schedule. So the first thing I want to get is maybe uh, the cost of each door. Uh, the count of doors that I have, um, maybe the description of door, maybe the family that the door is being used, uh, the fire rating, the finish might be quite useful. So let's send them across and let's also send the type and the mark across as well. Once we've got these, we can reorder them and shuffle them around to get them in the right position. So I want count at the bottom, maybe I want cost just above that. Maybe I'll have family, mark, type, description, finish, fire rating, something like that. Press OK and Revit will go ahead and it will pull a list of schedule for you. So a bill, a bill of materials, a quantity um, takeoff, an information takeoff, whatever you want to call it. Currently, it's pretty empty because I'm using just basic, simple, out-of-the-box families. But we can tweak and customize this as we see fit. So what we have is um, a list of components, individual at the moment. If I go on to level zero here, just to show you the intelligence, let's put on a window tile. If I zoom out a little bit, um, this information is live linked to the model. So if I select an element inside of the model, or indeed if I come in and select an element inside of the schedule, it will highlight it in the model. Okay.
These are on the floor above, obviously, but it will go through and it will highlight the individual elements that we have in the model. So we have a live link between the information on the right hand side in the schedule and the information inside of the model. So, for example, we could come in and start tweaking and changing the properties in the schedule. Nice way in which we can come in and very quickly start filling up property information. I'm just going to open the schedule for a second. With that schedule open, I'm going to edit it and say that I want to sort them by first their family, then their type, and I do not want to itemize every instance. I want to take out the mark field, as I don't particularly want that for this example. So let's take the mark and remove it. And then let's come in and say, OK, perfect. I have all of these different counts of doors. I can start adding descriptions. So I'm going to just grab copy paste in here, but change it to external. I'm going to change the finish. So that's a composite material. And then these are just going to be wood. I'm not being overly accurate for the purpose of today, but what we have is absolutely fine. You'll get the idea. So I can add all of this information in. I can add fire ratings directly through the schedule. OK. This is now actively going in and it's updating um, the schedule or the property information for each one of these. You get the idea. We could come in and add information on costings should we have the costings, so on and so forth. Everything is live. So once again, if I go back to the floor plans, let's just go and grab a tiled window. Just keep your eyes on this count here. I'm going to grab this door and turn it into the smaller door. You'll notice that we have one less line, and this line now has two instances. If I come in and say, right click, create similar, and add in another door that now has three instances. So everything in the model is is live. Once you've got these sectional information, these schedule information, so on and so forth set up, even as a, a dumb empty entry in your template, as soon as you start modeling, it gets filled up. Guess what? You're going to have this schedule on a drawing. If your model updates, the schedule updates, which means the schedule on the drawing will update. We kind of say that you get your 2D or your information for free almost because we're putting all of the, the work in up front. So getting an output is very, very quick. Against this door schedule, maybe I also want a door legend. So I'm going to say view, legends, legend view, and I'm going to call it Rob's door legend. I'm going to have that at a 1 to 50. Let's just close down this one get a full screen on my legend view and say annotate component legend component I get a list of every single component loaded into my model I can go ahead and find my doors say that I want a floor plan of that specific door and place it in a view I then want to see a front elevation of that door and place it in a view once I have that, let's just make sure that they are aligned. There we go. Once I have that, I can maybe add a fine level of detail, maybe a shaded look and feel, maybe add some detail lines to put a rectangle around the outside. Maybe that rectangle is going to have a couple of areas for some text. So maybe I want uh, the description of the door down here, maybe. Maybe I want it to say set elevation and, and floor plan whatever it might be. So I could just add in some text. Maybe I'll add some text just here that says floor plan. Maybe I'll copy that text downwards. Type in elevation. It helps if I spell it right. Um, Elevation view. And then at the bottom, we might have a description for the door as well. We might have a door mark on there, um, whatever it is that we want. So we come in and we customize this so that it looks however we want it to look. 
very quick, very easy. We can position things. We could make this a little bit more accurate. I'm being very um, on the fly today, which doesn't really matter for what we're doing. But there we go. We've got something that looks like that. I can then grab that, copy it multiple times for every type of door that we want to show in our door schedule, and then simply change the component that it's looking at. So I want single door, external single door, and internal single six. We come in and we change the relevant information. Can't remember which one this one was. That was the external single. So on and so forth. Once we have that information, we can then take that alongside our door schedule and we could place that onto a drawing sheet which we'll do in the next step. So what I want to do is just jump ahead a little bit. So I'm just going to save this model. It's going to close it down and I'm going to open a more developed version of the same model. So let's go to open. Let's go to my desktop. Let's pick up um, um, this one here and open it up. So with this open, I'm just going to jump into the 3D view. It's the same design. It's just been far, uh, far more developed. Um, it's got some topology in there. It's got a pool house. Um, it's got some RPC elements. It has some components on the inside. But typically speaking, it's the exact same design that we've just been working on. I've just spent a little bit more time making it look a bit more finished. So we still have our, um, our door legend that we've created just here. We still have our door schedule that we've created just here. Everything's just been a little bit more finished. So we've got better components, we've got better properties, um, and we've got more of a design rather than a conceptual design. What I want to do is, um, is just develop some detail, maybe around one of the walls. Um, I'll choose this one over here just because we've been looking at this now for a fair old while. So we'll come and uh, look at my pool room over here. Um, and just do a, a bit of a detail view here because maybe this is the biggest argument as I say against Revit is um, the detail. So let's try and um, attack that uh, that myth now and make this um, look the way that you would want it to look on the drawing. So I'm going to choose my, uh, my section and I'm going to choose to section this piece of wall. Just note that these are currently blank. So this section view is not placed on a sheet and it does not have a sheet view related to it. Let's double click the arrowhead to go into that particular section. Let's just tidy these up a little bit so I can actually see what I'm doing, moving them to the left and the right. I want a detail of sort of this area here so I can see the buildup of the wall um, and what's going on around the roof. So let's go to view. Let's go to call out and create a rectangle call out view around there like so. In this call out view we want to drop to a fine level of detail. We want it to be on hidden line and we want to show it at a much smaller scale. With that smaller scale we can now grab this first floor level marker and bring that back in so that becomes part of our annotations for this view. So we've got this wall and I want to make this look like brickwork, this look like block work, this look like brickwork. I want to ensure that I've got the correct look and feel around the roof, some insulation and some wall ties. So let's come to annotate. Let's come to use our component tool that we used earlier and let's pick up a repeating detail component. You'll notice that we have brickwork section and block work section. Now all that is for your reference is we've got a single detail component such as a piece of mortar and we've set that up to be repeating by saying basically repeat this component every x millimeters. That means that I can come in very quickly and say create some sectional brickwork and I can grab a starting point and start drawing.
That basically goes in and adds all the layers of mortar. But as well as doing that, it's also cutting away the brickwork. So if I just do an undo, you notice you have a consistent line. If I have a redo, that consistent line is now gone, making the drawing look like brickwork. This particular piece of mortar component has a wipeout behind it, um, a, um, a masking region, meaning that there's just a, a, a transparent um, or an invisible border white fill which is hiding what's behind. Simple but very very effective. This detail has nothing to do with the wall as such, it's just lines, arcs and circles, but we can still move it around and do whatever it is that we want to do to, to get it to look however we want them to look. So we have very effective um, ways of adding detail lines onto the bricks. We can do the same thing for the block work and I'm going to choose to align it with the mortar just there and bring that up to the roof level. I'm going to add some more brickwork on this side of the roof. Let's just turn thin lines on just so I can get that snap point and move that upwards like so. And we have something that's starting to already look very nice. Now alongside that, this roof is not correct. This um, um, weatherproofing strip at the top would wrap up here to make sure that we don't get any leaks in the corner. Uh, again, that's just the detail that you wouldn't have in the 3D model. The 3D model must always be um, an agreed um, detail level representation. Um, so it's never going to have as much detail as in the 2D. But that doesn't mean we can't make the 2D look the way that it's meant to. So cut profile, grab the relevant layer of the roof. Remember this roof is one object, but this is recognizing that we have these layers configured. So grab this one. I'm just going to draw an open profile. Um, I'm just going to eyeball it really. It doesn't really matter too much. Let's just go up past that uh, piece of mortar and then come back down. It's important that you leave the profile open and this arrow points towards the profile. Press the tick and that will wrap that profile around there. Let's turn off thin lines. I'm just going to drop to 1 to 5 uh, and just see what we've got so far. Looking pretty good. Let's add some wall ties. So let's come back to um, annotate. Let's go and add a single detail component. Let's add a wall tie. These can be rotated with spacebar. Um, so once you've placed a wall tie, it will come in its default. Um, but we can rotate it in any way, shape or form that you would want to rotate it. And we can come in and place these wherever we need them around the model. OK, so I can grab this particular piece of mortar here. Select that wall tie, copy it upwards, 450 centre. Let's then come down, copy it, 450 centre, twice. So there we have some wall ties. I'm going to add some insulation, 37.5mm, no offset, draw in the far side, and I'm going to draw that insulation up to about there so far. I need to draw my flashing and my DPM, DPC. I use detail lines just as you would in AutoCAD. We come into AutoCAD and we would draw lines, arcs and circles. So all we're doing in Revit is we're adding lines, arcs and circles on a specific line style to add in my DPC and my DPM. Um, these will be set to have specific weights. OK, so specific weights, specific colors. These are almost Revit's version of layers, if you like. So I'm going to grab my DPM and I'm going to choose to draw up here a little bit along into the brickwork. Up into the mortar. Typically, I've placed the wall tie in a really awkward place, which is a little bit annoying, but it doesn't matter too much. I'm just going to go up to the next one. It doesn't really matter for the purpose of today. OK. Once I've got that, I might just move that wall tie up a little bit. Not ideal, not particularly accurate, but it will allow me to redraw this the way that I want it. So let's just create similar and come in, there we go, up one line and across. Let's do the same thing, so another detail line, this time for my DPC. I'm going to add that along here, like so. 
Okay. Grab my insulation, drag that beyond. But this time I now want to manually cut that back. This would stop at this point. So it wouldn't come past our DPM and our flashing here. So I'm going to say add a region. That's going to use invisible lines. So I cannot see um, the outside of them. And I'm just going to draw um, around that profile. Once I've got that, I'm going to press the tick and just show you that you basically get, let's bring that to the front, this wipeout. I'm then going to grab the relevant components and just send them to front to back to get the order correct. And then I'm going to come in and just um, edit the boundary of here and just make sure that it's going over the relevant pieces of geometry, but not going over the other relevant pieces of geometry. So it's only cutting out the insulation and not the brickwork or the block work, so on and so forth. So it's very easy and very quick to start detailing, and hopefully you're seeing that from what you've got in front of you now. You can also start tagging elements by their category or by their components. As you've seen, we can place dimensions onto the layers of all the walls and the layers of, of roofs, so on and so forth, to, to really get a nice detail view of exactly what you want to get a detail of. So um, this is just, just a case of however far you want to take it, really. Um, it's worth pointing out that these detail components can be imported almost from AutoCAD if you want to. So if you've got a lot of 2D details that you want to reuse inside of AutoCAD, we can. We can add material keynotes and start picking up information intelligently from the materials that have been added um, to each individual component on here. Uh, it just depends how your model is configured, but we can very quickly start adding detail onto here, which can then be added onto our drawings at a later date. So really don't be put off by the fact that we're working in 3D. We still have an absolutely fantastic 2D detailing workflow, which really is second to none. Let's just go back to our ground floor and just remind ourselves what we have. I'm just going to go down to my sheets. So this is basically paper space in Revit. We call them sheets. Um, all we do on sheets is just place views. So I'm going to right click and create a new sheet using my A1 title block. The A1 title block is filled out automatically based on properties that we have in the model. And then all I'm doing is grabbing floor plans and dragging and dropping them onto that sheet. It automatically gives them a name, a scale and a view. So I'm going to grab my first floor and ground floor plan views and drag them on to my sheet. It aligns them nicely and it's very easy to work with them. I'm going to go in and grab my section, section one, and I'm going to drag and drop that onto a view and place that around about here. Based on placing section one, it's now got view three. Section 1 callout 1 won't fit on here because of the scale. It's, um, it's far too big. But if I just place that to the side, we've got section 4. I'm just going to go out to um, go into that callout and I'm going to try and make it fit. It's going to look a little bit uh, blocky. But I just want to show you that what we're getting on that um, um, with these intelligence is that when we're placing this information onto our model, that could get away with being a little bit bigger. Let's go one to 20. When we're placing this information on our model, um, it's giving that view um, detail. It's giving it information. It knows how big it's going to be, so on and so forth. So um, it's also doing tedious tasks for us. So this call out is now view four on sheet A102. The section is now view three on a, on sheet A102. Everything starts happening quickly and everything starts happening the way that you would expect it to, which is hugely beneficial. It's doing those tedious tasks for us, which um, can limit human error um, and it can make the process of putting these drawings together a lot more straightforward. Everything in those views can be controlled, turned on, turned off, and made to look exactly how you want it to look by selecting certain components and hiding them, showing them. Typically, we say in Revit, what you see is what you get. 
So you make it look the way that you want it to look in the view, and then the sheet just displays that the way that it needs to. I'm going to throw my door schedule onto this sheet, and I'm also going to show my door legend on this sheet as well. And just to finish this off, I'm going to show you that as well as putting that information on there, we can also start tagging the doors and the windows on here if we wanted to. So if we had our mark inside of our door schedule, we would simply just go to our ground floor. We would use our tag by category. We would say that we want to tag, oops, start that again, tag by category, select a door, just need to load in a door tag for this particular example. So let's go to my annotations, tags, and go and find a, uh, a door tag. Mark and fire rating will work perfectly. And let's come in and start tagging a couple of these doors. Those tags can be customized to show whatever it is that you want. But naturally, as soon as you've added them, they're going to appear on your floor plan. OK, naturally, if you change the type of door, everything will update on your floor plan. Everything will update on your sheet. Everything will update on your table, so on and so forth. Everything becomes interlinked. So once you've got these things set up, it's very quick to make changes. You change something in one place and it will update every, everywhere else, therefore giving you the benefit of, um, of saving a lot of time potentially. So let's just finish this off by having a little tour of what we've done um, whilst I have gone in and added a little bit more detail um, onto this um, model with some topography, um, some building pads, some RCP elements um, and this pool room over here. Pretty much we have the same design. I've just gone in and added in some, um, some additional components and some materials or changed some of the materials. Just to finish this off, we're going to use uh, Enscape just to have a little walk around just to show you the kind of outputs um, in 3D that you can get from this very quickly. So let's um, go ahead and hit start to launch Enscape. This will just take a couple of seconds to, to load and launch. And then I can have a little look around this model in a 3D environment. And we'll just take a couple of minutes to do this. I'm not here to demonstrate uh, Enscape today. We have other videos on our channel. Um, which you can watch should you want to see an Enscape demo and maybe I'll add another one um, with this specific model um, later on. So let's just make sure that we don't fall through the floor and uh, walk up and have a look at the front of our building. So it looks pretty good, um, very aesthetically pleasing, whether it's um, during the day or um, at night time. So I can change the time of day here to take a look at um, how the light affects my design, what happens when um, the artificial lights come on in the model. And I can pretty much just have a little look and, and feel around the model and, and see if I'm happy with the way that, uh, that, it's, um, that it's outputting. Um, and what you can see is you get a very good result using tools like Enscape. Uh, Revit Live also gives you pretty good results um, directly. Um, and Revit's indirect rendering as well is, is pretty good, um, although I, I favor Enscape because it's so um, so quick to be able to get results. Um, so there's the building. It looks pretty good. Um, there's our pool room where we did our, um, um, our detail of the roof there. Um, and inside this house now, we've got, um, let's just speed our walking up a little bit. We've just got some components that we've placed in and around the lounge, the open plan dining area, the garages, the upstairs space, so on and so forth. So, you know, really good tool sets. Um, but what I wanted to do over this last hour or so is just really hopefully dispel any myth myths that Revit is difficult. It's no more difficult than working in 2D. I actually find it easier working in Revit than working in AutoCAD. But the time savings are huge, and I really can't stress that enough, is when you've gone through the process of doing a drawing, um, having to update that drawing, um, have manual elevations, sections, um, manual takeoffs, quantities, so on and so forth. To be able to get to a point where um, you can update something in one location, and then it updates everywhere else automatically. 
you don't have to redraw a section or redraw an elevation that to me really is um is key and is where we all kind of really should be um, and revit very easily allows you to get to that point so i hope that's been useful today um if you want any more information let us know i'll try and do um maybe another video at a later date which goes through how i've changed the materials on this model and and how i've got the the more aesthetic results with the materials and the components but um hopefully that's been useful thank you for watching and uh, we'll catch you again soon